Hello everyone, my name is Yelizaveta Semenova and today as part of the PyMC on conference we will build together an ordered logistic regression model. First of all, many thanks to the organizers of PyMC on conference and uh, I must say it is really strange to not be able to present to people live rather than trying to record the whole session being on my own at home. So if anything is unclear or seems strange in this recording, please feel free to reach out to me and you can see my contacts on the screen right now. All the materials which you will need to reproduce um, our, our track today is available in this GitHub repository. You will find the data and the Python code as well as the environment and I will mention later while you, why using this particular environment would be very important. So what is uh, this work about? Today we're building a model to trying to look at drug induced liver injury or so-called DELE. Why is it important? It, uh, because actually DELE is one of the main reasons of attrition of drugs during the drug development um, process. And also it is a common reason of withdrawal of a drug from the market. And our aim is to try to build in silico models to predict clinical daily preclinically. So we want to understand what will happen to patients while they are treated with a certain drug, the patients, women, women real humans. Um, but we want to be able to predict that before putting the drug into a human. And why is it very difficult? Because toxicity or specifically liver, um, liver specific toxicity might be caused by various reasons. And uh, also this uh, different types of toxicity are specific to each drug. One of the ways to approach prediction of clinical toxicities in humans is observing toxicity in animals. But unfortunately, even those studies do not translate into humans very well, which underlines the need for in silico models. However, Classical and silico models, traditional or let's call them frequentist models, require good amounts of data. While for us to be able to collect data on clinical toxicity, we actually need to be observing a vast number of patients over a long period of time to see whether they are developing any toxic, uh, any side effects caused by toxicity. So in reality, such data sets, when we talk about classical machine learning, such data sets are relatively small. And this is where Bayesian methods can help us a lot. First of all, uh, just because they can help us prevent overfitting, Bayesian priors have regularization effects but also we might be able to provide our predictions with information about uncertainty. So it is very important to understand in the toxicity setting whether a drug is toxic, but also how certain are we in this statement. All the work presented today is just part of this paper called Predicting, Predicting Drug and Used Liver Injury with Bayesian Machine Learning. Originally, the code and the model for this paper was developed by Stanley Lazik in R and Stan. You can find both code and uh, Stan and R code as part of the publication and also code for Julia and Turing is available. Today, we will look at the implementation using Python and PyMC3. How does this model work? As uh, many statistical models or machine learning models, we have a set of predictors, 
which we denote by x, and an outcome which we denote by y. So in this case, a set of predictors are assay readouts or physical chemical properties of compounds. So assay readouts are obtained from in-house safety toxicologists. So before a drug can be tested on an animal, it can be tested in laboratory uh, using a so-called in vitro method as opposed to in vivo method. So in vivo would mean we're testing already in live beings such as animals and in vitro testing means we are testing literally in glass. So the whole concept is as usual, we want to take a set of predictors X and we want to be able to predict the outcome Y. And Y in this case is the severity of drug and use liver injury. In our data set, Y, the outcome variable, is represented as an ordered categor categorical outcome with three classes where outcome, uh, when it equals to one means a drug is very safe. When the outcome equals two means that the drug is moderately unsafe. And when Y equals three means the drug is highly unsafe. And we will use the likelihood of the ordered logistic regression for, uh, for prediction of the outcome. How does it work? So in reality, we first turn our predictors X into an underlying continuous predictor, which we denote by eta, while our outcome is a discrete variable to transition from the continuous predictor to discrete predictions. We need to also infer the threshold between the three classes. So we denote them by C. In our case, since we just have three classes, we will have two thresholds, C1 and C2, which will break the domain from minus infinity to infinity. This is where our predictor eta lives into three regions. So what are the parameters of this model? As we said, we will need two thresholds, C1 and C2. And also, how are we calculating the latent continuous predictor from assays and uh, physical chemical properties of compounds X via a linear transformation? And to perform this linear transformation, we use regression coefficient beta. So the set of parameters of this model are beta regression coefficients and latent thresholds C. The number of regression coefficients is the same as the number of features which we have in the matrix X. Now to specify the Bayesian model, we have already specified the likelihood and to finalize, we need to specify the priors. Let us start with thresholds C1 and C2. We do not know much about them. And as we said, variable eta, the linear transformation of the predictors leaves on the space from minus infinity to infinity. That's why we're giving thresholds very, uh, quite uninformative prior. So we believe it's probably centered at zero, but we are very uncertain. That's why we're giving it very large standard and standard deviation. For uh, regression coefficients beta, we're using hierarchical prior. So we define the prior for beta itself as a Laplace distribution, which is more conservative as compared to say normal distribution. So normal distribution will look more smooth, while Laplace distribution will look more peaked, which provides stronger regularization as normal or T distributions would do. And 
the, hier uh, the hierarchy of the prior comes from also mean and standard deviation of the Laplace distribution. The mean of the distribution now is specified as normal 0 2 and standard deviation for the Laplace distribution is defined as half standard normal. And this hierarchical structure of the prior for the regression coefficients provides regularization. This is a nice figure taken from the paper made by Stanley Blazik. It summarizes very well our overarching goal of this work. We will obtain as a result for each compound um, some values on the continuous scale from minus infinity to infinity, which can then be via logistic or inverse inverse logic transform can be trans um, can can be squished between zero and one as if we were doing a regular logistic regression, and already this gives a good visual representation of compounds varying from safe to medium and highly unsafe. And then for each of such compounds, we will be able to visually represent the risk profile, such as on the left-hand side, uh, compounds with the distribution skewed in this direction are rather safe. Compounds somewhere in between are moderately unsafe and compound like looking uh, with posterior distributions like on the right hand side are highly unsafe. So let us have a look at the code. This code has been written more than a year ago, when, uh, about one and a half years ago, and that's why it was using a later version of PIMC3 than currently available. So to avoid any confusion, I have also provided the environment which uh, was used to write this code, and environment is available in the repository on GitHub. So we include the libraries which we will need to build this model and also visualize their results, such as uh, Pandas and uh, Scikit-learn for standardization of data, Costiano to enable IMC3, as well as uh, plotting libraries such as Seaborn, Matplotly. So let us look at the data. What is important for us? We have the name of drug. Well, uh, the name of the drug is not important to build the model, but it is really nice to have an identifying or in form of an actual drug name for later visualization. Then uh, the second column, DLE severity category, is a classification from one to five, which was later recorded into the outcome as we will use it. So the order of this classification is reverse. So this column, DLE severity, contains numbers from one to three, one to, from one to two, three, yeah. So one, two, and three, as I described earlier. And this is the outcome of the model on our training set. And the values in between, as well as the BA, the bioactivation, are our predictors. So there are continuous predictors, such as SA readouts and physical chemical properties, and bioactivation is a binary predictor. Let us clean up this data a bit. So we extract drug names for later visualizations, and also we extract data which we will use for training. They are all of the predictors, both continuous and discrete, as well as the outcome variable. Here, for convenience, we are renaming some columns, changing the dot to 
underscore and also our test data will consist just out of two records and of course apply the model to test data is of high importance the training data consists of compounds which already have been in the clinic so we already know what those compounds are doing to humans whether they're, they're toxic or not but once we want to develop a new compound and we have read the assays in the lab now using our model we want to be able to say is this compound safe is it unsafe and how certain are we in those statements so at this step we are preparing our uh, continuous data for the model and here we are adding bioactivation back because so we have performed standardization for continuous variables but the discrete predictor did not require such an operation so now we have our complete uh complete um set of features for the training set ready using the um, features our next step is to construct design matrices so we will not just use the features as they are we also will include interactions of all of them. And very important since we are working with a proportional odds with a logistic regression model, we need to take the intercept out as compared to say linear regression model because the role of the intercept is already played by threshold C1 and C2 then we include interactions by using the formula notation and we keep the last continuous predictor log 10 transformation of cmax outside because it has um it is supposedly one of the strongest predictors and might uh, might kill the signals coming from 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 the assays so we separately now have two design matrices for train and test data as well as just one variable with the um, outcome values of the training set. Now it is about time to build the model. Of course we start with an opening statement and what we need to specify are likelihood and priors so let us start from the end of the model and move up as we would do when we are writing the model down on paper in mathematical formulas so let us start with the likelihood as mentioned we are using the ordered logistic distribution luckily already implemented in a pymc3 library we need to give this variable a name uh, let's give it a name y ops or y observed um, then we need to provide the linear predictor eta and we will calculate this linear predictor as said as a linear transform of the input variables then we need to provide the cut points which are our thresholds c1 and c2 and we also need to specify what is our actual data so here the code is written in python that's why for categorical variables the coding will start with zero that's why from the original data that we read from the data set where the values are one two three if we subtract one we obtain values zero one two moving one row up how can we calculate the linear predictor what we need is the dot product of our training set uh, of features and the regression coefficients beta so it is important that we to in order to be able to use this dot product within 
the PyMC3 code, we need to specify it as a tensor in terms of PyMC3 and Fiado. That's why it is not enough to just define this as dot product as we would do, say, using the NumPy library, just as dot product, product here, and then pass it into the PyMC3 statement. It is very important that we use also PyMC3 library here to calculate the dot product. And then we are specifying to PyMC3 that this is a deterministic transformation of the data and the parameters. So now let us move to the priors. As we said for the cut points, our prior was normal with mean zero and standard deviation 20. So we are writing down that we are using the PyMC3 distribution no called normal. We also give this variable name, cut points. And here is a little trick. PyMC3 would not allow us to use mean with the same uh, two values in this vector, 0, 0, because it expects a vector which is already ordered. So just by distorting the fast value ever so slightly, uh, we're saying it is a very, very small negative number. It does the trick and the error message disappears. Standard deviation is more straightforward. It just accepts a number. So we have specified now the prior for cut points and the remaining bit is to specify the prior for beta. As we said, our prior is the Laplace distribution. As always in PyMC3, we're giving this variable a name. Logically, we call it beta. And our mean and standard deviation are again specified with hyper priors. So the hyper prior for the mean of the Laplace is uh, coming from normal. Again, it is important to use a distribution which is already implemented in the PyMC3 library. We give it a name which we can recognize and which is not repeating any of the existing names yet. And similarly for the standard deviation, we use the half normal, so the normal plus distribution, just like normal distribution, but just the half of it. Um, the half of the distribution, which is defined only on the positive range of values. And um, in reality, the standard deviation of it is one, could have just written one here, uh, but to be able to experiment with it a bit more, I have uh, specified it as a separate number outside of the model. Then to be able to pass our training feature matrix and training outcome variable, we need to use the shared functionality of Fiano. So we define X shared and Y shared, and the same functionality we will use in the future when we would like to rerun this model or to use the results of this model on a new data set. Again, we will need to call the shared functionality in a similar way. So we ran the model. It took us some time to run it, not too long. There were some, there were some warnings, but no errors. And uh, what we would like to understand now is whether the model has converged. We can assess the convergence either by looking at quantitative diagnostics, such as R hats statistic or number of effective steps, or we can inspect them visually. So one way to inspect the convergence visually is looking at trace plots. This is the right 
column here now and um, we would like to see stationary plots. What is a stationary plot? It means if we cut a piece out of this whole plot and translate it in any direction, the plot would look very similar. So basically each part of the plot looks more or less like a replicate of some other part of the plot. And roughly speaking, if we see fluctuations of the, the, uh, the samples of this variable around one constant value, this is roughly what tells us that we have achieved a stationary state. Um, the important parameters for us now, let us look at betas. Yeah, they also, it looks a bit messy because all the trace plots of all betas are overla overla overlapping, but more or less it does not worry us much, looks good. And same for cut points, so presumably the lower trace plot is for the lower cut point and the upper segment is for the upper cut point. Second way to assess convergence visually is by looking at the posterior distributions. And what we do not want to see is some crazy multi multimodality. So for instance, looking at the posterior distributions of the two cut points, we see that four chains of the sampler more or less contain the same information. So if we had to calculate statistics, say such as mean or mode for C1, the lower cut point from all four chains, those four statistics would be very numbers very close to each other. And same for the second cut point. And we see that all four chains agree with each other quite well. Also, as mentioned, we can look at quantitative measures of convergence. For instance, looking at R hat statistic, which assesses between chain variation to within chain variation ratio. And if this number is close to one means chains have converged well and it looks like they have converged well. We have now run the inference, means we were able to draw from posterior distributions of the model parameters. What we would like to do though is to predict the actual using this model and the samples from posterior distributions of the model parameters, such as beta and cut points, we would like to calculate the predictions for our outcome. That's why we run, we use the functionality of posterior predictive checks, and this is what allows us to compute the values of the variable y obs, y observed. By using this functionality, we now have drawn from, from posterior distributions of Y observed. And using those values and the helper function, so here are the, our functions are the logistic function and also a function which calculates proportions of each category for a given drug as well as the percentage of a distribution in each category for a given drug. And also a helper function to calculate further summary statistics. So to um, make all the predictions that we want, we first extract the linear predictor and use the logistic transform to squish those values between zero and one to later also be able to, uh, to apply the transformed values of cut points on that range between zero and one. 
um, also to inform our decisions, uh, we pre-calculate the average profile of all most toxic compounds. So we extract the results for all the profiles of all compounds from category three. And whenever we will be visualizing results for both safe or moderately unsafe or also toxic compounds, we will always be overlaying them with the most toxic profile. So this will give us, again, a visual way to judge how safe or unsafe a compound is. This is a function for plotting, um, quite involved, so we will see the results later, what it does. Here's a uh, an example of such a visualization just for one compound. So one can produce those plots for any of the compounds used in our data analysis. So what do what we see on the right are the quantitative statistics which show the proportions of the distribution lying between the threshold, the true category in this case, it is a moderately, uns, uh, moderately unsafe compound and also extracted statistics. So this black line on the background is the average profile of most toxic compounds. So as long as the profile of the compound that we are looking at is not too reminiscent of this black line, probably it is not too bad yet. So yes, we can see it is not an entirely safe compound, but it is also not the most toxic one. And as the true category tells us, this is an, a moderately unsafe compound. Now we have used the data to draw samples from posterior distributions. And now using the same model, we can make predictions for the test data. And, and as mentioned, we are using now this shared functionality. So as a rule of X shared, which is the design matrix used in our model, we pass the values of X test, which is our design matrix for the test compounds. And also we pass some dummy values for Y shared because actually we do not know what are the outcome values for the test data set. Furthermore, this is exactly what we are interested in. We would like to understand the two new compounds for which we are providing data. Are they safe or are they unsafe? So using the same uh, functionality of PIMC3, the functionality for posterior predictive check, we calculate predictions for the test data. We extract the results for the outcome variable Y observed, and then we calculate probabilities using one of the helper functions that we have defined earlier. And uh, we would like to just look at numbers. So for compound one, what we can see, the probability of this compound to be safe is about 50%. And probability of this compound to be moderately unsafe is about 50%, so 50-50. And it is very unlikely for this compound to be highly toxic. So probably it, it could be a safe compound or it could be moderately unsafe compound. So we know that it is not toxic and our certainty between category one and two is roughly 50-50. Let's look at the second compound. Again, the probability to be in class one is about 52%. Probability to be in class two is about 44%. And it is really unlikely for it to be highly toxic. So probably both compounds are not in 
ton are not completely safe. So they're sl they're more toxic than just eating a an apple or a carrot, but they are unlikely to be highly toxic. And our certainty about both of them to be in class one or two is roughly 50-50 chance. So as mentioned, all of the work and uh, the model and the data and the reasoning behind it is described in the aforementioned paper. And just to give a broader overview, I would uh, like to shamelessly advertise another piece of work which is related. So today we have discussed the proportional odds logistic regression model, where from the set of predictors move, we move via the logistic regression model straight to the outcome variable. In our other work, related work, we have plugged a hidden layer in between where we move from known predictors, same as before, physical chemical properties of compounds or end assay readouts. We move to a hidden layer, so some values which we do not know, but we calculate them similarly. Like now we have com uh, calculated linear predictor. We just perform linear transformation on the input values and then again pass them forward to predict the outcome variable. Um, so both works are now published and uh, to find earlier versions of the text in PDF format, I have provided the links below. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed building this model today and enjoy the rest of the conference.